The truth of the matter is, I am a black woman that grew up in the Deep South. White supremacy was a threat, you know, to not only our livelihood, but our lives. Coming in and seeing what I've seen this morning, it puts me back in touch of my own purpose. It re-quickened my reality that the movement has to go on. It cannot stop. I think it's extremely important to know the history and the background, to know the facts, where we came from and what we did, and so that way we could change it and make a difference. It was definitely a, an eye-opener, especially coming from a white person. This is for the ones who can no longer sing for themselves, for George Jackson and George Floyd, for Lieutenant Colonel Lemuel Penn and Breonna... I got the history, I got the point. However, it made me do a self-reflection. Am I doing enough for my people? Am I doing enough for my community? Because change starts with you. The legacy of the civil rights movement is what teaches us how we need to go about actually getting the rights that we deserve. Because they started the fight, because they ignited the fire, we're able to continue that fight and maybe it won't be so long for us. The civil rights movement will never end, right? Until the world is just, there will always be a movement. This museum is very empowering, it's very encouraging to everyone that comes here. And they see the messages, they see the pictures that just make you believe that you can do anything. I believe that when all of us take the time to really just lean into the possibilities that exist, when people can tap into their humanity, that that's when change happens. We want people to feel like that we're in a critical juncture, that we've got the ability to make history. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King modeled what it meant to face fear head on. My responsibility of carrying on that legacy is to ensure that we keep that torch lit and never let that light die out. All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Civil Rights Memorial Center. We're here today with our author, Fergus um, Borderwick, and today we're here to discuss his latest book, Clan War, Ulysses Grant, and the Battle to Save Reconstruction. So thank you all for being here tonight. We're here for um, a good conversation, listening session, and to learn more about our prestigious author and his book, or several books that he's written. And just before we get started, just a quick note, this event is part of the CRMC, which is a Civil Rights Memorial Center talk series. So for those of you that utilize social media or have friends, family that utilize social media, just to learn about this event today or events that we have in the future, if you want to look up the hashtag four pound sign, it's going to be CRMC talks and you always can learn more information about some of the events that we have going on here at the Civil Rights Memorial Center. Just to start us off, welcome again. My name is Lauren Blandon and I'm the manager here for the Civil Rights Memorial Center. So I wanna thank you all that are here with us in person, as well as our audience members that are connected to the live stream. Thank you all for taking the time to come today. And before we get started, just a little bit about our author, Mr. Fergus. He's an author of nine nonfiction books, of course, with the latest being Clan War. And in this book, Borderwick described the, the Ku Klux Klan as the first organized terrorist movement in American history. He has been an independent historian and writer since the early 1970s, a frequent book reviewer for the Wall Street Journal along with other periodicals. And he's also born in New York City, where early experiences helped shape his preoccupation with American history 
and the issues of race and political power. So what I'm gonna do now, head over to the seat and we'll begin our conversation with Fergus. Once we conclude with the conversation, we'll open it up for question and answers from those of you here in person with us and we'll open it up for any questions that our audience members on live stream have. Also, just a quick note, the bookstore, New South Bookstore, they're outside selling the books. So once we conclude, Fergus, he'll be able to join the bookstore outside if you have any questions, want to engage more in conversation and purchase the book. So thank you all again for coming. All right. Thank you, Fergus, for joining us tonight. How are you? I'm just fine, thanks. I'm very happy to be here. I want to thank you personally, Lauren, and the Civil Rights Memorial for having me here. Uh, I can't imagine an audience that, that would that will have a better grasp of what we're going to be talking about and what my book is about. So, it, you know, it I'm, matters a great deal to me that we're doing this this evening. Yeah. Thank you for being here. And just to start the conversation off with something you just said, can you tell us a little more about what started or some thoughts that you had when creating this book? What brought everything about? Sure. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to read something very short from W.E.B. Du Bois. And what he says here occurs at the end of my book, but I've reflected on it a great deal, and I think it frames perfectly what, uh, what really drove me in writing the book, okay? okay. Du Bois, as I'm sure many uh, of the people out there and here uh, know, wrote a superb book, uh, Black Reconstruction, in 1935, which is the seminal book about Reconstruction in the 20th century, largely ignored because the subject of Reconstruction was largely, or the reality of it, was largely ignored until decades later. Du Bois wrote this, and this is, again, in 1935. He says, one is astonished in the study of history at the recurrence of the idea that evil must be forgotten, distorted, skimmed over. The difficulty, of course, with this philosophy is that history loses its value as an incentive or an example. It paints perfect men and noble nations, but it does not tell the truth. If we are going to use history for our pleasure and amusement, for inflating our national ego and giving us a false but pleasurable sense of accomplishment, then we must give up the idea of history either as a science or as an art. And this is a really profound observation about history and the purposes of history. And uh, what I wanted to do with, with Clan War, uh, which culminates a number of books that I've written that, that have uh, dealt from different angles with race and slavery and, and the, the politics of, of, of race and the Civil War, uh, was to... Uh, uh, drag the truth, some of the truth, some of the truths about Reconstruction out of the dust closet, you know? There's a lot in this book people will not like. Uh, that's to say Americans maybe more broadly, who, especially those who might have been raised with a sanitized idea of Reconstruction as, well, oh, this is this big failure, never should have happened. Uh, uh, freed people, black Americans weren't up to it and corrupt northern carpetbaggers and so on just exploited the poor downtrodden south. Anyway, um, which was, you know, the Jim Crow version of Reconstruction that, that thrived for more than a century. And indeed, I've talked to people I said, when I talk about this book who've still been educated in this way of thinking even in, in recent decades. Um, and I mean, a couple of truths about Reconstruction. One, it was an immensely ambitious, forward-looking, in today's terms, you would say progressive movement, an attempt to refound the United States with, with, a great, with um, principles of greater fairness, uh, uh, civil rights, to bring four million formerly enslaved people into the body, the, the American body politic, into public life and, and into education and so forth. You know, this was a bold, dramatic attempt 
to change America, to change the whole southern portion of America. Um, and uh, I mean, we can talk after a bit about why in the end it didn't achieve its goals, but that's, that's a separate subject. But the Ku Klux Klan, as you said, was America's first terrorist movement, organized terrorist movement. Uh, its goal? was one, to destroy the freedoms of uh, formerly enslaved people uh, during the period of Reconstruction, and to destroy the embryonic two-party system in the South, uh, the frail shoots of the Republican Party, and I'm, as I'm sure most people listening will know the Republican Party was the more forward-looking party of that time that, that tended to support a stronger uh, center, central government and wanted to see the federal government enforce civil rights laws in the South, protect them in the South. And the Democratic Party at that time, 1860s and 70s, especially in the South, was a reactionary party uh, that was extremely deeply racist in a country where racism was part of the warp and woof of American life anyway. The Southern wing of the Democratic Party and pretty much the Northern one was rooted also in a racist and openly white supremacist uh, philosophy of what America should be. And if people think I'm plucking terms like terrorism and white supremacy that don't really, didn't really fit in the 1870s, that I'm just kind of using modern terms. I'm not. These terms were used then. They're, they were used then uh, in the 1870s. Uh, and I, I wanted, to show how this, how this dynamic, sounds like a strange word to use, but this dynamic terrorism, which spread uh, um, uh, extremely rapidly from about 1867 and then climaxed about 1870, 71, and when Ulysses Grant cracked down on, he broke the Klan in 1872, 73. Uh, if you want to look for a comparison in the modern world, think of ISIS or Al-Qaeda in the Middle East. Americans don't think, by and large, that we could be like that. Terrorism is something that happens in faraway countries and perpetrated by organizations who name, whose names sound kind of strange. Well, this is as homegrown as you could possibly be. And uh, I've, it seemed urgent to me in this time with, with that we live in today, with uh, you know, rising insurrectionist thinking, hostility to democratic institutions, basic American institutions, by some parts of our society, uh, and the truly, to me, terrifying uh, proliferation of guns everywhere, and it, particularly the enthusiasm for guns amongst people who also seem to be enthusiastic about the idea of insurrection uh, and to be eager to use one or another kind of political intimidation against ordinary poll workers, voters, office holders. This is what was going on in Reconstruction and what the Klan did. Fortunately, we're not seeing the mass execution and assassination yet. That, that characterized the Klan era in the 1870s. But I felt it was imperative and urgent to see that this is, this is in our society, it, it, you know, and, the, and the potential for it to become a lot worse than it is now exists if you look at history. So speaking about um, how you mentioned the, the truth and talking to, as you were doing your research, speaking with others about the truth, whether they wanted to talk about it or not, um, what were some, or what are, for those who have read the book or had the chance to read the book and those who may not have had the chance, can you speak a little more about the truth and some of the highlights that you sure. um, wrote in the book? Sure. Um, this is the book of history, by the way. It's, it's not a polemic about present day politics. You will, I think it'll cause you to think a lot about present day politics, but it's, this is history. This is history. Uh, I traced the Klan from its origins not all that far from here, in Pulaski, Tennessee, uh, some distance north, across the Tennessee line, in 1866, uh, and follow it as it spread across 
virtually all the former Confederate states. Um, and then uh, 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 perpetrated terrorism systematically, thoughtfully, and with intent, um, almost with impunity, because it, it, it penetrated institutions, government, local sheriffs, constables, intimidated juries. In its first years, uh, it was almost impossible to prosecute crimes committed by the Klan because the Klan's menace had, had so uh, paralyzed public institutions, okay? Mm -hmm. What happened? Um, Ulysses S. Grant was elected president in 1868, uh, takes office in 69, and uh, I spent a lot of time reading letters that were written to Grant coming from the southern states, from freed people. And uh, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them, uh, some of them beautifully written, others painstakingly written, uh, with people who clearly had just learned to write and were, were kind of figuring out, struggling to make themselves heard, but free, freed people and also white Republicans. And we have to think of Reconstruction as a period when, for a while, there was a, a forward-looking alliance between uh, both a newly empowered freed people, freedmen, and uh, since we can't say freed men, were, freed women were all that empowered, mm -hmm. regrettably. They were free, but they couldn't vote. Um, and uh, white Republicans, some of them having come from the North, many of them homegrown, because the, the pre-war pre -war society in the Southern states it was an oligarchy. I mean, the poor whites uh, often had not much more and maybe no more political power than African Americans had. Uh, so there were there were poorer whites who initially, kind of, regardless of what they felt about race, were willing to go into political alliance with with uh, freed people as they as they rose politically. So I, I, I chronicle all this because this is the the context, the ocean in which the Klan swam, so to speak, mm -hmm. and what they wanted to destroy. And I follow Ulysses Grant, fascinating man whose reputation was smeared okay, by lost defenders of the lost cause, pro-Confederate defenders and historians who absorbed that way of uh, looking at the Reconstruction era. Grant, as he evolves from a uh, uh, a military man who was who was radicalized during the war. He came. His father was an abolitionist, though Grant himself wasn't an abolitionist uh, until during the war. He uh, he did have a deepening feeling for what enslaved people had lived. He welcomed um, uh, fugitive slaves into into his military camps, found work for them, and he strongly supported recruiting. Uh, black American men to fight in the Union cause. Uh, 170,000 of them did finally. And uh, he, not every general did. There were gen other generals, like William Sherman, who was so, so racist. He, great general, but a deep racist and, and mm -hmm. uh, would not have black troops in his armies. So I follow Grant as he's coming to grips with the end of slavery, uh, with the new revolutionary world in which freed people were embarking. Uh, and uh, as a result of rece receiving, reading these hundreds and hundreds of letters, thousands actually, uh, becomes determined. He, he realizes that the war, what was won in the war is going to be lost in the, re in the post-war period unless the Klan is destroyed. Uh, and he, and by 1870, 71, he is, uh, with the support of uh, what people who were then called radical Republicans in Congress, mm -hmm. uh, uh, enact a series of laws, they're called the Force Acts, um, that will empower the president to go into the South and both with troops and with new legislation, which he will use to break the Klan. And he, uh, uh, thousands of Klansmen are prosecuted, 
uh, indicted, uh, at least 5,000 are indicted in different states. Its focus is South Carolina, but also here in Alabama, uh, in all the southern states, federal prosecutors are given the power. And if this sounds like the 1960s, it's not a coincidence because the prosecutors of the 1960s uh, during the, the, the uh, muscular period of the early civil rights movement, which is so beautifully illustrated here, and, uh, are looking back to, to the prosecutions of the 1870s as precedents. Uh, uh, and so the Klan is finally, the, the, the military goes after them, particularly in, in the Carolinas. Um, and it turns out that Klansmen are awfully brave when they're flogging, shooting, lynching, uh, raping uh, uh, African Americans, usually isolated, unarmed, and alone, uh, aren't so brave at all when they're faced with uh, 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 cavalry troopers with, with carbine rifles. And they, the, the Klan caved when they had to face actual soldiers. They were cowards. Frankly, they were cowards. They were only brave when they were, when they were uh, uh, terrorizing people who were helpless. I mean, that is a fundamental fact of, of, what, of what Klan terrorism was. You know, there was no, no courage in it at all. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, uh, it, it, we all know it's a disgrace that the Klan thrived at all. But the more you, you probe into the details of what they were doing, the more contemptible their, 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 their terrorism was because they never, they never thought people could fight back. Another follow-up question I have for you. Um, an audience, I promise I'm going to get to you all. Um, when you talked about just fighting back and some of the parallels or comparisons when you completed the research and started the book, when it comes to the 1800s and the 1900s, can you expand a little and just talk about some of those comparisons that you see today in society? Huh. When just thinking about things like voter rights, racial injustices. Yeah, yeah. Um, sure. I, I, I touched really briefly on that a, you know, a few minutes ago, but mm -hmm. let's, let's say some more. Um, well, I mean, it's a, it, it, I want to reiterate that it's important to understand, I think, that, that, I mean, this country has grown a lot in a century and a half. We are not living in 1870, you know, fortunately. Uh, uh, but the, the kinds of impulses that you see in, in uh, you know, towards, towards white supremacy, toward, towards, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the willingness to menace people who, uh, Think differently from you, and I, I mean, I, unfortunately, we're in a period of ascendancy, which which we've been able to see in the last few years. Dare I say that grown more since around 2016, and certainly uh, was in was vividly demonstrated on January 6th a couple of years ago. Uh, I mean, um, I think that. In the 1870s, white supremacy was taken for granted by a lot of Americans. It wasn't exactly an argument. It seemed so obvious to particularly those in the South who were products of, of a slave-dominated society, a, you know, a slavery-dominated society. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, frankly, to anyone who uh, lived through the civil rights era, and you know, with all the, uh, I mean, the, the 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 positive changes we've seen over the last fifty years, it is shocking. I mean, shocking to see move, uh, movements in this country today that will embrace, maybe sometimes using literal language of white supremacy or re so-called replacement theory, that that. Uh, uh, you know, people will foster fear at the uh, over the the notion that non-white people are, uh, you know, are somehow going to catastrophically replace white people. I mean, it's this stuff is so shockingly preposterous; it's hard to believe, except the people believe it. But unfortunately, we see them. We see them, and uh, that there are obviously people in the country today uh, who 
look back, perhaps, to the, this bizarrely idealized idea of the, uh, you know, the, kind of the white version of the Jim Crow era, which was that things were as they should be, you know, and want to return to some kind of society like that. I mean, it's not going to look like 1870. You know, I mean, people don't wear, don't have to wear the hoods anymore. They wear polo, polo shirts and chinos, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and baseball caps, you know. Uh, and and uh, uh, the, the, the terrorists of the 1870s, 1860s, and, and afterward, it's not as if it just ended when the Klan broke. We know that. But my book is primarily about the Klan period. Uh, they were completely open about what they were doing. I mean, if, uh, if, we, if we had a lot more time here, I'd read you some of the statements that were made publicly. There were, uh, my, even, even, there was a newspaper in Tuscaloosa, the mm -hmm. Tuscaloosa Monitor, and the editor of the newspaper was simul uh, man, Ryland Randolph, was simultaneously the editor of the Tuscaloosa Monitor, uh, the head of the Klan, uh, and a member of the state legislature. All three, he was a busy guy, but, uh, uh, and uh, the, the, the newspaper would run woodcuts, images, images of, of um, Republicans being hanged, black and white Republicans, by the way, being hanged. He urged it, and, and the banner of the, uh, you know, above the, 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 the title in the newspaper was, uh, uh, white rule forever, something to that effect. It was all open. It was open. You know, I mean, today, you know, people are, by and large, a bit subtler. And it's sometimes, you know, people are smarter, smart enough to kind of, sometimes, I don't want to belabor the point, but uh, to, to um, uh, use more acceptable language with, with perhaps a similar intent. So, you know, I, I, I am very optimistic about the country, okay? I'm very concerned about uh, these menacing trends and the, the, the kind of subtle or not so subtle resurfacing of racist thinking, uh, and particularly combined, as I said earlier, with this, this rampant gun culture. I mean, the people who are the most menacing and believe in menace are also the most heavily armed. This is not a joke. This is not a, this is not a joke. Uh, it needs to be taken seriously. If we're going to draw any conclusions from it, by the way, from my book, by the way, and I, I you're leading me to my next question. Some conclusions, ahead, takeaways from the okay. Clan War. Yes, I'm glad you asked. Thank you. I'm glad you started it <laughs> off. <laughs> uh, is that? Uh, Ulysses Grant's administration won the war against the Klan. They did break the Klan. I mean, why wasn't everything okay after that? Basically because uh, Reconstruction was betrayed and abandoned by Northern voters who, who got tired of the South's troubles. They absolutely did not want to finance uh, 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 the army in the South any longer, and uh, they didn't want to pay for the prosecution of more Klansmen, and they, they began electing Democrats, reactionary Democrats, mm -hmm. short version. We can talk a lot more about the details of that. Uh, but Grant's policy worked, uh, and why? It was decisive, it was based on moral principles, but it was also practical. He knew exactly what, he was a soldier, he knew exactly what was necessary to break uh, armed, you know, and armed, armed insurrectionists. There were, by the way, at the peak, possibly something like 300,000 Klan members in the South, way more than there ever was in the 20th century, okay? And the state of North Carolina, which has pretty good statistics on this, 40 to 50,000, just one state, North Carolina. And those mm. numbers are approximately similar in most of the other former Confederate states. So, uh, the federal government acted and it acted decisively. And fortunately, we're seeing today the, the vigorous prosecution of the insurrectionists from January 6th. Uh, you know, they're being taken to court, they're being prosecuted, 
and, the, uh, and they're being tried openly. I mean, this is in keeping with kind of Grant's approach, if you like. And uh, uh, I think, you know, we need to take this stuff seriously. When I say, in, you know, the, uh, the, the attempts to undermine, subvert, even overthrow our, our, our basic institutions. It needs to be taken seriously. It's not a joke. Uh, but on the other hand, we have the power as a, uh, in our government and as a people to prevail over this stuff. We do. Uh, 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 and, uh, you know, I, I'm, uh, unless, uh, I'd hate to see a different, uh, you know, a different administration come into power in Washington that would not prosecute this stuff. And, and I, 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 I can't avoid thinking about that. But, uh, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, at present, I, I've been very heartened, actually, by the determination shown by the administration in, in, in going after, and, and, and in other states as well, by the way. Uh, California has been notable, actually, in, in, in um, uh, 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 shedding light on and, and trying to combat uh, you know, a radical uh, right-wing subversion, in the state, extremism in the state. And there are, there are others as well. I just happen to know that one a little more intimately. Uh, so, you know, I think it, 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 it concerns me a lot the, that in polls, public support for our institutions and for Congress has plummeted. It's, it's shocking and it's frightening. Actually, that worries me a lot, and and you know we need to, we need to really remember that that you know uh, that the institutions we have can work, and they are working. They are working. You know, this country isn't a failure. Congress isn't a failure. The presidency isn't a failure. You know, even people who ought to know better say things like that. It's not true. It's not true. You know. Our, our loss, of, loss of faith in these institutions is more worrisome than the institution's shortcomings. So, I, I, you know, I, I think we need to really care enough about these issues to support government in dealing with them. It, you know, it's not, it's not enough just we all kind of get together and agree with each other, mm -hmm. you know, as we might in a room, a room like this, I'm, I'm, I'm supposing. But, uh, you know, we, we need to support a, a action action, as, as, as Grant uh, demonstrated 150 years ago. Okay, thank you for that. And so what I'm going to do now, I'll take a few minutes to get some questions from our audience members here in person. I don't want to do all the talking, give you a quick break, um, and then we'll open it up to see if we have any questions via our live stream. And so we have Angie Alexander, she's our education coordinator here at the CRMC. If you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand and Angie will hand you the mic for the questions. Any questions, comments? I'm a bit of a ringer. I'm actually Fergus's wife, but um, I read the book. So, okay, <laughs> twice. Anyway, um, one of the things that I think was interesting to me, to, just to go back to the 19th century from the 21st, is giving us the context of like how many, you talked about the number of Klansmen, which I think is shocking, and how they uh, you know, permeated the institutions uh, from the police to the, to the legislature. But how many people were actually murdered by the Klan during this period your time? It's really basically five years from the origins until um, the end with, uh, of the Klan with, with Grant. And also you, in the book, you talk about two particularly horrific murders in North Carolina. And I guess my question is, are those, are they um, one, you know, anomalies or were they actually representative? Maybe you want to say a couple of things about those in particular. Are they representative of what happened in, in other places as well? Sure. Um, okay. Uh, nobody knows how many uh, people were murdered by the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, I'll explain why in a second. The, the minimum that have been documented, thoroughly documented, conservatively, it's about 2,000 between 1865 and 1876. That, that's a minimum because many, many deaths took place kind of uh, that were of black, of black people. 
uh, that were essentially unnoticed, unrecorded, or what you find is uh, in, in the original literature is uh, 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 Negro killed. That's, that's about it. Barely any mention beyond that. And there are other people who lived in the hinterland. In, 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 in a lot of America, especially the South, was totally rural, of course. And, and people lived scattered in isolated areas. So the numbers are unquestionably higher. What, how much higher, I, I hesitate to say, because I, I, I want to deal with what's docu documentable. The two cases you mentioned are these. And both of these uh, are from North Carolina. One of them opens the book, actually. And this is the uh, murder of Wyatt Outlaw. That's his, his name. That's a North Carolina name. Uh, it wasn't an epithet. It was his name. Wyatt Outlaw was a remarkable guy and very representative of uh, the kind of talent that, that, that sprang up once uh, uh, former slaves were, were, were freed. He, was, he had been a slave, but was uh, literate. Uh, a skilled craftsman. Uh, he, had joined, he, he went off and joined the Union Army during the war, he escaped, came back and became an organizer for the Republican Party. And he was elected to a, a town office in, in the small town of Graham, North Carolina. And he was uh, taken out of his home, it was in 1871, he was taken out of his home, about 20 uh, bizarrely dressed Klansmen broke into his, his home, tore him literally out of the arms of his mother. He was, he was a middle-aged guy, uh, but you know, 40s, perhaps 40s, even 50. Uh, out of the arms of his mother with his, his child crying, don't take my daddy. This is recorded. And it's not just, it's not fiction, you know. Uh, tore him in, in, in his nightshirt, forced him, uh, forced marched him down the road about a quarter of a mile to the town square of Graham and, and hanged, hanged him. Uh, on a tree opposite, facing the 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 the, um, the courthouse, which is where the Republic, the very fragile biracial Republican government sat. It was a message to the government, and they uh, they sliced him across the mouth because he spoke. He was somebody who spoke up. There's a, it, the viciousness and and barbarism of things that were perpetrated by the Klan. I haven't mentioned in this conversation a lot in the book. But uh, it doesn't. It, it, that's one example, and and fairly pretty common. The other example, also in North Carolina, was the murder of a white state senator, who was completely allied with uh, uh, black freed people, uh, who elected him to office. And he was he was he had been a relatively poor white guy before the war, but he. Um, uh, uh, threw in his lot with freed people. He was, he was a Republican. Anyway, um, John Stevens is his name. And he, he was marked for death. But he, he said, I won't, I won't leave my voters. I won't leave my voters. Anyway, he was uh, waylaid in the, in the, in the county courthouse in, in Caswell County, North Carolina, in, into the, a basement office under false pretenses and he was stabbed, lynched, and strangled. <laughs> All the while, on the floor above, there was a Democratic Party meeting taking place with people directed to stamp on the floor to cover the sounds of his being murdered. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are a lot of these stories. There are a lot of these stories. This was standard operating procedure for the Klan. <laughs> Um, I mean, not not everybody obviously was killed. Just threats and intimidation were sometimes enough. Any other questions or comments? We have one over here. Oh, okay. Well, good evening. Um, so your book is probably going to be banned in in Alabama, but uh, <laughs> um, but my question is: well, first of all, you, I I like to hear your comments on the banned book in Alabama, if you have any. But my question is: uh, you mentioned something about um, 
the poor white people being the most uh, understanding for the poor black people. I grew up in Alabama, and all my life, all I heard was the poor white people were the worst. Can you tell me a little bit about um, how you, how, where you found the information? Yeah, that's a really good. It's a really good point. Uh, uh, I hesitate to generalize, frankly, because when you look at white Republicans of the 1870s, they really came from kind of all classes, actually. Some were small business people, some were, you know, dirt farmers, uh, some were ex-Confederates, believe it or not, who just, you know, the war changed them. Uh, now, bear in mind, of course, in the end, there weren't enough. That's true. I mean, it's not as, I, I don't mean to imply that all kind of poor whites were natural allies with poor blacks. It's absolutely not true. I mean, a great many were uh, manipulated and uh, by, the, you know, there's a tendency to think historically, for most people, I think, that to imagine that the Klan was pretty much a bunch of louts and losers and thugs and and, and, and types like that. Now, uh, the ver nearly all Klan leaders came from more educated classes. They tended to be professional people, doctors, lawyers, uh, journalists, like the guy I cited before, Ryland Randolph and Tuscaloosa. Um, uh, they tended to be educated. The founders were all college educated. Uh, yeah, uh, no, it's quite interesting, as a matter of fact. And these were the people who had a stake in the system. And they, and many of the rider, the night riders, were also those people. Uh, and often they, they, how, how did they recruit um, poorer whites to do much, much of the dirtiest work for them? It's race, race hatred, race hatred manipulation. Uh, they were all these people. They were, the general membership were not necessarily all those poor louts, if you like, because when you when you read the testimony of Klan members, and one of the one of the uh, most valuable documents I used, you see one volume here. This there there are thirteen volumes of the Federal Joint Committee investigation into the outrages of the Ku Klux Klan carried out in 1871. It was the uh, uh, most significant joint committee uh, set of hearings in American history up to that point. And uh, subcommittees travel around the South. Include, this is one of the two Alabama volumes. I, I, and this is all online, by the way. I mean, I, I bought myself a, a hard, hard copy. In here are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of uh, pieces of testimony uh, from freed people. It was the very first federal committee uh, that ever took testimony from African Americans. And there are hundreds in here from all, all the states. And also from women, by the way, the first one ever to take. Uh, and, and the testimony from freed people is uh, astonishingly intense because people haven't finally are able to tell those in authority what happened to them. You know, and their hope is for the federal government, to, for the federal government to, 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 uh, to step in, which it was doing at that time, and save them from this, this unbridled violence. Um, the confidence that free people had in the federal government is both heartening and heartbreaking, because ultimately they were let down after some time. Uh, but there, the, the committee also took testimony from all kinds of other people, including Klansmen, who, who always lied. They said, well, I'm not really sure there's, I, I've heard of something called the Ku Klux Klan, but we don't have it around here. They always say the same thing. That is what they are prescribed to testify by Kl the Klan Constitution. So, but, uh, it's, it's a goldmine for understanding who really is in the Klan. 
And often the freed people giving testimony, one way or another, re recognized people who were brutalizing them because they were from the neighborhood. That's not always true, but it's often true. Uh, so what the one thing the Klan did accomplish was to separate uh, uh, whites from blacks because it, it played on racism that was so embedded, it was so deep, uh, that even whites who initially kind of saw that they had some interest in common, they may not have felt much warmth, but they had a common interest with, with newly empowered free people, were separated from them through terror. That was one of the goals of the Klan. And at that, they pretty much prevailed. Not 100%, but pretty much. And yeah, so the people you might have encountered or your parents might have encountered 100 years later might have been the grandchildren or the great-grandchildren of a one-time Republican Unionist of the 1870s who succumbed to, 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 to racial terror and, and changed their color. I think we have time maybe for one more question from our audience here in person or a comment. Yes, Angie, right here. So you spoke about the Klan's beginnings in Tennessee, and also you touched on just the the vast number of people who eventually became part of the KKK. And I'm wondering, you know, given that the KKK eventually had chapters all around the United States and beyond, if I'm not mistaken, um, I'm wondering if you could touch a little bit on the methodologies, the main methodologies used to sort of grow the KKK and to spread that ideology far beyond Tennessee's borders? Okay. Um, the, K, the, 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 the most pertinent answer to that is that there were three clans. There were three clan eras that are not much connected. The original clan is the one that my book is about, the post-Civil War era. Uh, and uh, the second clan uh, comes into being after about 1915. It's probably the only terrorist movement in history that, that was inspired by a movie, uh, Birth, Birth of a Nation, a brilliant, horrible movie. I, I mean, fascinating, incredibly racist movie that, that romanticizes the Klan. Uh, and um, it, it inspired, the second Klan was, was, was started as an entrepreneurial operation, actually. It, it, it was a money-making business, actually, and then it, it took off again. And it, was, it had more members in the North than the South. Uh, it was a different, it was a, you know, it, and it had a whole other set of targets than the original Klan had had. Catholics, immigrants, various other, Jews, various other, you know, vulnerable, or perceived to be vulnerable, vulnerable minorities. Uh, then the third, the third, that Klan just, just, imploded because of its total corruption from top to bottom, financial corruption and scandals. The third clan really arises after World War II, mostly in the 50s, uh, as a reaction to the modern civil rights movement. There was a, you know, there are really thin threads connecting these, but they're not the same. They're not the same, exactly the same movements. They use the same, obviously, ideology and demonology, if you like, uh, but it's not as if it's, it was a continuous movement all this time. Um, was there another part to your question? No. Okay. Thank you. Do you still have a question? Incarcerated are poor whites who did, who seem to not have known. Just they were following what they were being told by the government. That was number one. And number two, what I find is that right now, in terms of anti-Semitism and anti-immigration, it's again 
following the same path. And I'm thinking around the lack of immigrants in the South and those that were here were persecuted by those same types of people. I'm thinking about the, the folks, the Italians in um, Louisiana. Well, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I hesitate to generalize about the whole section anyway. You know, okay, I, 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 I'm not sure I would, would, would do that. But uh, uh, sad to say, I mean, I mean, bigotry is wove, woven into our, 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 our culture as a nation. You know, it, uh, uh, there's no place where it doesn't exist. You know, uh, the, the, the question is what you can do to prevent it from prevailing and what, what uh, you know, and so on. But I, I, you, you touched on something that, that, uh, that um, uh, is interesting. The, amongst the so-called insurrectionists of January 6th, more than 25% had university degrees and more than 50% were business owners. These were not... These were, these were not the kind of poor, hapless, ignorant people at all. They were statistically heavily middle class, even. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, well, actually, we, we live in Washington, and they're incarcerated sort of about a mile and a half from where we live. And, and their supporters come and, come and sing patriotic songs to them every Saturday morning. But uh, 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 not very entertaining if you don't think they're heroes, which I don't. So now I think we're just going to take an opportunity sure. to see if we have any questions or comments from our virtual audience. Yes, we do have one question. Um, how, how do you approach using overtly racist primary and secondary materials? Well, look, I, I think it's imp it, it is essential to understand people in their own time, okay? Which is to say, I mean, if you read my book, you will find language in there that we do not use today, uh, uh, because it, you want to. Uh, it's you need to know how people spoke to each other, how, how people spoke to each other, because it tells you how they thought. You know, I, I, I. Uh, you know, I I am really adamant about about not not um, editing language. Uh, I think people we should all say what we mean and mean what we say, and and uh, something that's true about the 19th century, generally speaking, is people do that, and they often say things that uh, make you make you make you kind of, you know uh, make you gag on all kinds of subjects, by the way. But race, yes, in particular. So yes, you will encounter uh, uh, racial language that uh, we find repellent today. And and there were people in that time who also found it repellent. But we should know what they're saying, and not not fudge it. I don't I don't I don't believe in that. That's not history. That's that's mythologizing, or it's it's uh, you know I, I, uh, it's it's what. Uh, is done in some other countries, and I, I don't believe in doing that. So uh, it's a challenge, you know. It's a challenge, uh, you know. There were the the bluntness of of language that uh, members of the clan will use, and it's not always just picking certain words that we find repellent, but just the the um, supremacist thinking that they're very explicit about uh, that you know that that embodies. The, the degraded vision they have of uh, African Americans. Uh, you want to know? I mean, I, I feel like saying sometimes to people, "You you want you want to know how bad this was." I mean, we can say oh, it must have been terrible. You want to really know? Read this. Listen to what these people are saying. And and I, I I want people to walk away from this book saying, "My God, were we really like that?" And you say, "Yes, we were." Because if you were talking about uh, the way people think, uh, not the implicit bias they have, but the 
the explicit sides of the hand. And I, I wonder about, excuse me, got it, okay. Um, uh, I just wonder about uh, what we see uh, today and as compared, and I know you've made some references to it, but uh, the bias that, uh, that I see out there, the words that I hear used, uh, the argument, and this gets to my point, the argument about genetic differences between races, but between white Christian nationalists and Jews, the all of those are sound a whole lot like to me, and I'm not sure that human beings would ever perform any differently or think any differently if they went that way. Uh, as to what you were talking about uh, in the 18, uh, late 1860s and early 1870s when Grant had the guts to try and at least shut it up. He didn't, he didn't close the thinking out, but shut it up. And I wonder um, how you relate, how, how what you wrote there relates to that that we see today, especially on the issue of genetic differences, which is, you know, this is the great replacement theory, and the people who are replacing us, us white Christians primarily, but us white nationalists in general, uh, they are lesser people. Well, yeah. Uh, I, mean, the, 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 I mean, the big difference is that uh, racism in the 19th century was close to universal. Close to universal. And we might like to think that our, our ancestors, our, our great-great-grandparents, we're, we're 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 the kind we're we're kind we're kind and free. I mean, free free of bad feelings towards other groups. Probably not, probably not. And and uh, I mean, people in the nineteenth century took these differences. I mean, they didn't have genetic theory, but they had the forerunner of that, which is all kinds of um, uh, you know racial you know racial orthodoxies. You know. Uh, yeah, uh, and you know, people weren't shy about those feelings 150 years ago. And those who, I mean, I've written a great deal about um, abolitionism and, and race in, in the, in the uh, 19th century. And I'll tell you, the number of people, and even among radical abolitionists, who are actually comfortable with African Americans, you can count on a couple of hands. It's rare. It was really rare. They may have acted morally to destroy slavery, to break slavery, to oppose it publicly, even made sacrifices, but they weren't actually comfortable with black people. You know, really, it was that deep and universal. So, you know, the people who are able to, in their history then, were able to transcend that kind of racial, uh, well, racism, uh, you know, uh, you know, they're remarkable, and Grant, Grant is among them. He evolves into that. Lincoln evolves, evolves, you know, from, from people who took a certain kind of bigotry as a baseline, you know, and they, but there were, there were people who were capable of seeing through it, but they're rare. So today, look, uh, I mean, we all know, we all know, it's, it, it, you don't need me to say that, gee, there's still racism in America today. Geez, you know, breaking news, you know. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, for a couple of generations, now society increasingly pushed this at least toward the margins, toward, toward the margins. So, of course, it's terribly disturbing to see it seeping back into the mainstream, facilitated by people who are in office, who are sitting in Congress today, or running for the, who, even somebody who was a president, you know? We don't need to talk about who that person is, you know? Uh, it's meant as a positive outlook on the future when it's scrambled up. And the 
I'm not shocked that there's hate. I'm not shocked by it because I, I, I think I think it's almost a universal phenomenon that 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 that, that bias and discrimination. I said to say, I think it's pretty universal. And I've worked all over the world when I was a journalist. You know, I've encountered pretty much the same kinds of thinking. And I, I think something that is remarkable in our history, remarkable, is that, uh, and going back to the even the late 18th, 19th century, is how this society has struggled, often not very successful, granted, and often failed, has struggled to come to grips with it, to come to grips with it, and to question itself about this. This is remarkable. This is not universal at all. And, and that is a very muscular impulse in, in, our, in our culture, not the U.S. alone, but, but speak, we can speak of uh, you know, a, broader, a broader culture. Uh, and I, I really have a lot of confidence, believe it or not, I, I may be in a minority in our institutions because I've, I've written so much history. You know? I mean, we've, this, this country has been through some incredibly difficult times before. You know, our memory as Americans isn't very long, but uh, uh, whether, whether we're um, thinking of the late 1960s, when an enormous number of Americans thought the country was coming apart in about three different directions at the same time. The McCarthy era, which I remember quite vividly. I, was, I grew up in a home where I thought McCarthy was a swear word. You know, uh, actually it was, you know, in my family. Uh, the, 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 the crises of the Depression, the, the, the market crash, um, and, and, you know, one, one, could, one could go on. You know, many, many forgotten crises. The 1850s, we had a civil war, you know. Uh, and I, I, think our, I think it's critical to protect our institutions. Absolutely critical. We will not survive without our institutions. We can survive a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of meanness and 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 and, uh, and bigotry because there are plenty of people who can't stand it. You know, the majority, frankly. You know, I mean, we can't be shocked. I think at at uh, that there are people who think repellent things. It's terribly dismaying, and it's dangerous. They're walking around carrying submachine guns. It's really dangerous. Uh, and uh, you know, we 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 live down the hill from the U.S. Capitol, uh, and uh, <laughs> you know, it was right up there. You know, um, uh, but, but I, I I think uh, I don't think it's any any a time to to kind of fold our tents and just I'm not imputing that to you. You know, I, I, look, I, I think, you know, politics is struggle. It's always struggle. It's supposed to be struggle. You know, I, I wrote a book called The First Congress, and it was about the creation of, of uh, the federal government. And, uh, you know, the Constitution didn't create anything. It's a piece of paper with a bunch of ideas, good ideas. Uh, the first Congress actually had to make the government based on that. And it was chaotic. It was chaotic. You think, you think it was peaceful. It, you, I, again, I'm not imputing this to you. It wasn't peaceful at all. Everybody, most people thought it was going to fail. There was no plan C. That was plan B already, the Constitution. Plan A failed. That was the Articles of Confederation. So I mean to say, this is, you know, James Madison said, uh, uh, we, are, we are in a wilderness without a footstep to guide us. That was James Madison. You know, you know, he's the darling of, of institutional conservatives today. But he was, he thought, oh my God, it's just not going to work. So in a sense, we're always there. We're always there. And I think false optimism and false, false optimism and false confidence is always dangerous. You know, and, and it's imperative to pay attention to what isn't working. Uh, I mean, we live in a building with... Uh, 43 members of Congress, just by coincidence, because it's where it's located. And 
you know, see these people, they're, they're, they're not lesser beings than, than, than uh, the, Henry, the Henry Clays and the Daniel Websters and so forth, uh, even if they're wearing gym shorts or something. You know? I think we have another question okay, for you with our virtual audience. Yes, thank you everyone who submitted questions online. Um, unfortunately, we won't be able to get to all of them, but we do have time for just one more question before we wrap things up tonight. So this is the, uh, the question. Has your research revealed anything new about the role of Nathan Bedford Forrest or other Confederate leaders in the formation and oversight of the Klan? It's actually a multi-part question. Um, was anyone actually jailed for Klan activities or were they too big to jail? Oh, great question. I mean, okay, so long as we can, as long as we'll be able to stay here until tomorrow morning, I'd be happy to answer. <laughs> uh, okay, um, uh, the Klan was organized. It was founded in Pulaski, Tennessee by a bunch of young guys, okay? And it wasn't founded as a terrorist organization, but rather as this kind of funky, wacky uh, fraternity. Uh, but it was, its potential for terrorism was very rapidly recognized. There was a there was a meeting. It's documented in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, with high-ranking Confederate officers or mid-ranking officers rather, who became the real founders of the Klan. They recruited Nathan Bedford Forrest to become its first Grand Wizard. A he was in large part a figurehead. Why? Because he was charismatic and because he was a ferociously kind of unreconstructed or unreconstructable, so it seemed, uh, Confederate officer uh, who was expert in guerrilla tactics, not accidental. Uh, I, for those who don't already know, Nathan Bedford Forrest was, had been an extremely wealthy man before the war. He made his wealth trading in human beings. He was one of the biggest slave traders on the Mississippi. During the war, he was very, he was a brilliant cavalry commander. He was also responsible for the Fort Pillow Massacre in 1864, uh, which was the massacre of a Union garrison that was considered, uh, uh, was comprised of about half black federal troops and white troops. His Confederates murdered them. This is the worst war crime committed on American soil outside the Indian Wars. Uh, and uh, uh, this was the kind of man Bedford Forrest was. So he was a, a, a good resume for a Klan leader, if you follow me. So what I think Bedford Forrest did was uh, kind of create the Klan's military. It, the Klan was the paramilitary arm of the Democratic Party in the South, to put it another way. It was highly decentralized. So it wasn't as if these people in Tennessee ran the Klan through its whole period. They didn't, but they created a template that was imitated over and over around the South. Bedford Forrest had a kind of cover job of working for a, an insurance company, uh, which enabled him to travel innocently uh, all over the South. And oddly enough, new dens of the Klan uh, sprang up wherever Forrest traveled. And he, t I think he taught, uh, or he set the pattern for the Klan's, which were essentially guerrilla tactics, of course, against innocent, helpless, uh, unarmed men and women, uh, rather than soldiers, as I said much earlier. Uh, so the, uh, m many of the members of the Klan were Confederate war veterans of different ranks, general, generals down to privates many of them. A lot of them were also kind of the younger brothers of the guys, but they were too young to have fought in the war, but wanted some action and, and, and were kind of recruited into the Klan. Um, uh, so what was the second part of the question? Oh, did I go to Jeff? Yes, good question. Uh, okay, it, about 5,000, in the end, about 5,000 members of the Klan were indicted. Um, thousands, thousands surrendered, uh, were jailed for differing periods of time. A very small number went to federal prison in Albany, New York, of all places. Um, some of the, 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 the uh, nobody was executed for Klan activity, no matter what 
the action a person had been found guilty of. Um, but uh, uh, many thousands surrendered, surrendered. Sometimes entire clans surrendered to the U.S. Army. Um, what what happened? I, I alluded earlier to uh, to, you know, to the betrayal of Reconstruction by Northern voters, essentially by Republican voters who got sick of the South, um, and uh, not, not wanting to uh, pay for for the pro the very costly prosecution of as many Klansmen as had been indicted. A lot of indictments just. It finally fell it fell apart because they weren't prosecuted, uh, and many many were, but the punishments often were pathetically modest. Uh, here in Alabama, for example, uh, uh, the, the, a federal judge who was uh, not a very strong radical, I would say, or not a very strong Republican, convicted people. Uh, 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 Klansmen were obliged to pay fines of. $25, $10, a dollar. Now, that isn't the currency of 150 years ago, but a dollar wasn't a hell of a lot of money in 1870 either, you know, uh, or kind of time served in the county jail. Might have been a couple of days, a couple of weeks. So, you know, the political will evaporated. Uh, but yes, I mean, you know, 5,000 were indicted. That's, that's a pretty substantial number. The, and and it did it did halt the Klan in its track. All right. Well, thank you so much for that, Fergus. This has been a great conversation. Um, as we're closing up, I just want everyone to remember the book Klan War. It was released this month. We have New South Bookstore outside who have copies of the book for sale. If you all would like to purchase some. I want to thank those of you attending in person here with us tonight, as well as to those via live stream. Again, remember that this is a series of our CRMC talks, so we host several book events, conversations, and signings with various audience, not audience, with various authors. Um, so please be on the lookout for what we have next, um, the next author that we'll be bringing in, and also to use the hashtag, hashtag CRMC talks. Fergus, I want to thank you so much for coming, joining us tonight. This has been great, um, and just thank you. For your thank you, Lauren, and, and thank everybody yeah. who, who's right. been present, either either in the room or out there in the ether. Yeah. And although we're concluding now, if you have another question, um, you yeah, can go I'll, outside I'll to talk to anyone in the audience. Thank you all so much again. Safe travels to you going home. Yeah.